All right. Um, hi again. Uh, it's I'm good to talk a little bit more about something completely different. Um, this time I'm going to talk about the bad guys um, and how they affect Bitcoin in various ways. Uh, so this talk is called hostile actors and, and, and attack vectors, and uh, I will be going through uh, a number of things. So the most important thing first, um, you should be uh, quite aware of how confirmations and reorgs work in Bitcoin because it's different from everything else uh, out there. <clears throat> so I will um, give some examples here. So we have a block, um, and in the block we have a transaction, which here I call 27C. I don't know if you can see it, but it's right in there in the block, uh, block one, two, three. So um, this transaction has uh, one confirmation, and the reason why it has one confirmation is because it's been built, it's been added to a block. So as soon as the transaction is in a block, it has one confirmation. Um, before it's in a block, it has zero confirmations. It's called an unconfirmed transaction. And uh, these are dangerous and should be ignored. So anyway, as someone builds on top of this block that we have our transaction in, we get um, two confirmations, because now we have two blocks that are protecting our transaction. And as we keep building more blocks on top of it, or as more blocks are being added to it by miners, the confirmation count goes up. Generally speaking, we want to have about six confirmations before we can consider our transaction to be final. Before that, it could vanish. And we wouldn't know. Or we wouldn't know, but you know. Anyway, so um, sometimes we have blocks that are found simultaneously. We have one block found over here, and then we have one block found over there. And um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's how Bitcoin works. But now we have two blocks. We have two blocks which are contending for position uh, for block number one, two, three. So we have one, two, three A and one, two, three B. And it so happens that our transaction, the 27C, 27C transaction, is in the A block. So depending on who you are, if you're this node uh, over here, you might think that block 123A is the, is the current block. You may be aware of the B block, but you are currently thinking that A is the block. So um, in that case, you think that 27C has one confirmation. But if you're over here and you're one of the nodes here, you will think that 123B is the current block. So in your, in your world, uh, 27C has no confirmations, and and this this can this can stay the case for a while until the next block is mined. So if the next block is mined on this side, uh, on the A side, then that becomes the fact for now, uh, and the the B block is being thrown out by everyone, including the guys over here, because now they have a bigger chain, a, a chain with more work, uh, in the a, on the A side. So in this case, our transaction that we put into the block now has two confirmations. Um, however, if if the if the uh, if the B side mines a block before the A side, we get another block over there, and in this case, we might have our transaction in that block uh, on the B side. So in this case, we have one confirmation uh, on our 27C uh, transaction, and in this case, the A block is is, is thrown out. So um, very, very unusual. I don't know if it's happened. Uh, but you may have uh, miners finding two blocks on top of each other simultaneously. And in this case, it just keeps going on. So um, if, you're on, if you're one of the nodes here, um, which thinks the A side is, is, is the truth, then you think that the 27C transaction has two confirmations. But if you're on the B side, in which the transaction was mined in the next block, not in the, in the first block, um, it only has one confirmation. So uh, people over here, they say two confirmations. People over here, they say one confirmation. And both, both, are, both are correct in this case. Um, there's nothing that says that this chain is more accurate than this chain. Uh, you can't use like the lower hash to, to decide which one is to, you know, the correct one. It's just, at this point, both chains are correct. So both chains are, um, uh, are valid. Um, so that's all good. But uh, I'm going to talk about a reorg. Uh, now, and uh, I'm going to talk about um, a case where we have um, two transactions that are actually competing with each other. And two transactions will compete with each other if they use the same inputs. And in this case, we see the 27C transaction, our good trusty one on the left side, um, and it's using the 356 
transaction uh, and the in index inside of that is using the index zero and it's sending to one ABC. It's sending all the money to one ABC, no change or anything. Uh, we also have another transaction, 45E, which um, uses the same input, the same hash, same index, and it's sending all of the stuff to one DEF instead. So this transaction sends, well, that transaction sends to eight, one ABC and, and, and the other transaction sends to one DEF. Both are valid at this point because they, they haven't spent, uh, it's not been spent or mined. So, um, so uh, in this case, we have um, 27C in the left side and we have 45E in the right side. So both blocks were mined simultaneously and, um, and they contain different versions of the same input. So in this case, uh, from the people on, on uh, I'm, I'm using my hands in the wrong direction, I think. So the people on the left side, they think that 27C has one confirmation because it's in the block. But they also think that 45E has minus one confirmation because it's been uh, replaced by 27C. However, the right-hand people think the other way. They think 27C has minus one and 45E has one. And uh, everyone is correct. Yes, this is the case. Until a new block is found, uh, in which case the truth becomes you know, a little more tilted towards that direction. So uh, here we have uh, the, the right-hand side being mined and um, suddenly 27C is, has minus two confirmations now because it's two blocks away from, from reality and 45E four, four, has, has two confirmations. Um, all right, so with that being said, um, oh, any questions about that, by the way? Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about thread model in Bitcoin, which is quite different from thread model in other software development. Um, so uh, just generally knowing your enemies, um, you don't really need to worry too much when you're doing proof of concepts and stuff, but uh, you should understand the dangers and you should know how to uh, address them, how to mitigate them. Um, so, you know, uh, this can be overwhelming <laughs> and you may think that it's, you know, you, you have no idea how to deal with all this, but, um, you know, just co cover, cover all you can cover and, and, and go from there. So uh, let's take an example. We do. Uh, we have. We're in a casino, and and we, you know, there's a coin toss. So head gives you 200 bucks, and tails give you 100 bucks. It's obvious that you want to play this game. If you played 100 tosses, you're gonna get, you know, um, you're gonna get what is it? You're gonna get two twenty thousand? No, yeah, twenty thousand, and you're gonna lose ten thousand. So you're gonna get, you know, no wait, you're gonna you're gonna get heads 50 times, and you're gonna get tails 50 times. So you're gonna get ten thousand, you're gonna lose five thousand. So you get 5,000, right? It's, it's obviously a good deal. But um, this might change depending on where this coin comes from. If it's a government issued coin and, or if it's your own coin or you can trust it, right? Yeah, you can trust that it will give you 50-50 uh, tails tails. But if it's a casino issued coin, it might give you heads one tenth of the time or one third of the time. Um, so Bitcoin development is kind of in this way. If you don't understand the what could be, you know, what people can tweak to make things that seem obvious not be so obvious, then uh, you're in deep waters. So um, let's look at some of the threats uh, on the blockchain. We have, um, I mean, the threats on the blockchain is, like I said, many differences to how you would do. You, you don't develop on a, on, on a blockchain the same way you would do a web server or a website, I mean. Um, and if you don't, to understand that you're gonna have problems for sure. You're, it's not just a level of maybe. I mean, you're gonna lose money. Um, and there's currently tons of, of software out there that is uh, very unsafe, and you should avoid at all costs. Um, so civil attacks is. Um, I will explain that now. Um, so another example, another casino. Uh, we're playing poker this time. And uh, usually everyone who's playing in this game, everyone is playing for their own benefit. Everyone wants to um, win and uh, they're not cooperating or anything. This is, this is all fine. Um, but what if everyone except you is actually hired by the casino to play poker and they're all doing, um, they're all cooperating in subtle ways to make you lose? That would be sad. I think, um, and uh, on the Bitcoin network, you um, when you have your node um, and you're assuming that it's getting data that is correct, 
In fact, uh, in a civil attack scenario, you might be connected to nodes that are all cooperating to fool you in various ways. They want to um, make you believe something that is not the case. They don't show you blocks, or they don't show you transactions, or uh, or other things. So um, there are there's several types of, of civil attacks. Um, one is you can attack a single node. You, you have a target, like an exchange node. If you figure out which this node is owned by an exchange, that would be a, a really nice target to uh, to just simple attack. If you can fool that node into you know thinking various things, then you know you have lots of opportunities there. Um, you can also do a partitioning of the network, which is a little harder. But uh, basically, you cut the Bitcoin network in two halves. So you have this half and this half, and they don't they don't communicate with each other anymore because they they only communicate with you in in between. You can also do a partial partitioning, which sounds useless, but it will help you um, delay, trans delay transmissions between two two edges. Uh, so uh, um, so you can fool people in various ways in that way. Uh, so um, some of the ways you can do this, you can set up a bunch of dumb scripts or something where you just connect repeatedly to the same node uh, from the same machine. And that is perfectly possible. And you can just exhaust all the slots so that the node doesn't have any more slots to use. Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that because of incoming and outcoming ports uh, or uh, slots. But it's um, doable. You can also have a ton of nodes. If you set up a bunch of nodes, you um, uh, that's very cheap, by the way. It's, there's nothing expensive about setting up nodes. Uh, you can also use those nodes to collectively uh, try to um, exhaust slots or um, you know make nodes connect to you only. Or you can do a man in the middle. You're an ISP uh, and someone has a node going through your um, server trying to connect to all these clients, but in fact, you're the one responding to all of those requests, uh, no matter what the IP is. Very simple. Okay, so um, how you can prevent or detect a civil attack is like you can see if the network hash per second drops substantially. That would mean that you're no longer on the main network, even though it's saying so. Um, you can um, a more straightforward, practical approach is to have multiple nodes. If you are an exchange, for example, you would want to have nodes in various places of the world um, that are uh, connected to each other through, for example, a VPN. Um, there's also something called BEEP 150 PR authentication. Um, I don't believe it's been implemented yet. Uh, I could be wrong, but you should check that out if you're interested in the, in the subject. Um, so um, before we talked about two transactions that had used the same inputs, that's a double spend. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, another example. So we have a check. You, um, I don't know if you guys are um, Americans, but Americans use checks. No one else in the world does. Um, so if you're American, you'll understand this. Uh, if you're not, just ask the fellow Americans around you or something. Anyway, so you have a check. Uh, you, send out, you, you get a request for a $300 check to an account, um, and the account has 200 bucks in it. Great. So now you have 500 bucks. But the check hasn't cleared yet, so um, you want to send a check for uh, 300 bucks, and then now you have minus 100. Well, um, if you check the check, then you probably won't be a problem if, you know, uh, and Bitcoin is kind of the same. This is kind of where the, the double spend thing comes into play. So uh, a double spend is basically, it seemed like you received money, it seemed like you received Bitcoin, but it actually didn't happen. You, you never got any Bitcoin. Um, so an example of how you can do this yourself, if you want to double spend someone, uh, you create two transactions. One has a really low fee uh, and one has a really high fee. And uh, you, t you tell the target about the, the low fee transaction here, you know, I'll send you money, look. And then they see the transaction and they're like, oh, great. And then uh, they give you uh, whatever, a car or a trip to the moon, whatever. And then um, immediately after they've given you whatever it is you're paying for, you uh, send out the high fee transaction on the network. So the network is going to see the low fee transaction, the high fee transaction, they're going to pick the high fee transaction, they're going to throw out the low fee transaction. So now you have. Uh, double spent the person. Because obviously your high fee transaction is sending all the money back to yourself. Um, there's a real example, but Peter Todd is, is trolling some exchange, I think. Um, you should check that out if you're interested. Um, oh, there's another way to double spend, which um, we talked yesterday about SegWit and what SegWit is useful for. So SegWit actually stops this, this type of attack, um, presuming that the sender uses a SegWit 
um, transaction. But so you have a transaction, and uh, you put that out in the in the network, and you immediately create another transaction, and if you want a third transaction, and these all kind of tie together, which is perfectly fine. You can do that. You have one transaction in the mempool, which builds which another transaction is using as input, and then using as input. So you have a, this chain. None of them have been mined, um, but but they're all out there. So um, so now what you do is you say to someone, okay, transaction three, I've sent this to you. It looks normal. It looks fine. And uh, the person sees the transaction. They're okay, cool. I got money. And then uh, you just change the hash of the first one. Uh, you can just do that. You can just resign it or whatever you want to do. And it, the, the transaction ID changes. And um, that means that the second and third transactions are now invalid, which means they're never going to happen because the transaction they used as input has, has vanished from, from, you know, the universe. So, uh, and anyone can actually do this. Uh, I can do this to your transactions. If you send me a transaction and a transaction and a transaction, I can, I can, you know, change the hash of the first one. That means the other two, the other two you had are um, are no longer valid. But SegWit solves this problem because now signatures are not inside of the transactions, so um, uh, so it's no longer possible to do. Actually. Um, I think it may not be possible for a miner to do this anymore, but uh, I could be wrong. Anyway, so SegWit solves this problem, so that's useful. Uh, another double spend, this is intentional this time, the user's wallet crashes. So you've used your wallet to send money, and it immediately crashes, but your transaction goes out there. So when you start the wallet again, it thinks it has money in a UTXO, which is no longer a UTXO because it was spent. So uh, the wallet then tries to send money again, and it will try to use this one, Except it's already been used, and the, uh, and if the first transaction is all is still in the mempool, the both transactions are valid, but one is double spending the other. This is a, a unintentional case, but it's possible. But anyway, so all of this comes down to uh, if you're receiving um, bitcoins, you want to um, base your conf the, con count the confirmation count on the value. So if someone is if you someone's giving you three bucks for a coffee. You, you could probably wait for one confirmation, and then you should be fine. You may lose three dollars, but it's not going to happen very often. But if someone is sending you a million dollars, you may want to wait a while, maybe even a day, which would be 144 um, blocks. So um, when you're under a civil attack, this changes quite a little, quite a bit, uh, or it becomes a little more convenient. So if the target is under a civil attack, you can double spend them more easily. Uh, you just, for example. You give them one transaction, and then you put another one on the network. Uh, they only see this one transaction because even if friends, uh, even if other peers are trying to send them the transaction, well, all of those other peers are you, so you're not going to do that, obviously. Um, uh, you can also, uh, when when the actual block is found, uh, which contains the the invalidating transaction, you can just not show it to them. Um, and um, yeah, so. Business logic side, um, there are some um, cases where business has failed us, and um, one of them is you know unsafe environment. The private keys leaked, uh, Bitfinex, for example. I don't know if you heard about it, but um, back, I'm not exactly sure when, but they basically um, lost a bunch of bitcoins, and that was a big mess. Um, also, atomic operations are kind of important. For example, there was a web wallet back in the day where you had, um, it was using the account system in Bitcoin Core, which is broken and buggy, and you should never touch it. Uh, and um, this web wallet used the accounting system so, to keep track of people's balance. Um, so if you had a Bitcoin, in, if you had one Bitcoin in your wallet, you could then send that somewhere. So uh, the thing that the way this worked is you type in the address you want to send to and the amount, and then you click submit. And when, when you click submit, it will do a get balance for your account, and it will check that you had enough, and then it will do send to address from your from your account, and, and then it will send. Right? Sounds good. But um, if you click the submit button twice, really fast, then it would go uh, get the balance, uh, and then it will do uh, it will start to send, but it will also get the balance. So the get balance would come before the send, so it would get balance twice, and you see, oh, yeah, he's got the money, and then he would send twice. So it would send money twice to the same address, and now your one Bitcoin suddenly became two Bitcoin, because, as I said, the account system in Bitcoin Core is horribly buggy. It will let you use money you don't have. Why not? Um, anyway, so, um, and also programming errors. Um, 
not so random random. Uh, non we're using a nonce twice or more, like um, the recent v WPA security issue. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about trust. Um, so I don't know, most wallets, like in a, in a mobile phone, are um, SVV wallets. Uh, not a lot of nodes, uh, not a lot of wallets are full nodes, because that would be a lot of bandwidth. Your phone would probably stop letting you use you know, the internet because you'd be busy talking to peers. But um, so SPV wallets requires a tremendous amount of trust. You have to trust wh whoever made this wallet or uh, whatever node you're talking to. You have to trust that they're telling you the truth, and you're not, and it's not being checked. You have to, you know, they tell you that um, a specific transaction is is nowhere to be found when in reality it's in a block. I think uh, Jamie Song or John Newberry. I think John Newberry talked about it yesterday, but. Um, yeah, SV wallets are, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues with them. I know Taj Dreja, who's going to talk later, he has lots of, he wrote us SV wallet, and he was like, what the hell is this? Um, anyway, and block explorers are basically the same thing. You, uh, unless you use like five of them to check, make sure that they're all saying the same thing, you, you know, you have to trust them that they're actually telling you, telling you the truth. Um, so now we're going into the realm of kind of uh, theoretical, but um, so, if cryptography would fail, how will that affect us? Um, so if there's a weakness in the elliptic curve used, uh, how would that affect us? Um, well, for one, if you're reusing addresses, which we've been repeatedly saying you shouldn't, then that's very bad. Because one of the strongest things is the fact that you're, you, you never show your actual public key uh, until you spend. But if you spend from the same address using the same public key, You've shown your public key, so if you have if you have other inputs using the same public key, then you you've exposed the public key for for that for those you know for the money there. So um, assuming the hash algorithm itself is not broken, which is very very unlikely, then uh, even if elliptic curves were completely busted, you would still be okay. Um, consensus problems exist. Uh, <laughs> We have Segwit2x and stuff coming up, so um, some would argue that would be a consensus problem. Uh, the network could just randomly fork because of software. Uh, there was uh, the BIP66 talks about strict DIR encodings, which sounds boring, but it was really exciting um, if you wanted to um, be safe, because um, if you encoded, uh, at, if you signed, if you do uh, an encoding of a signature in one way, in a specific way, then it would be valid to some nodes and it would be invalid to other nodes, and that would cause a, a split in the network. It was fixed in Bitcoin before any of that happened, but um, a lot of altcoins use Bitcoin as uh, as the base, and Bitcoin, you know, improvements in Bitcoin and pull requests and stuff is, is moving at an insane speed. So a lot of these altcoins don't keep up. And one of them was PP Coin, and they did not, even after month, if the months after the BIP66 was fixed, um, they didn't put that in, and they eventually ended up splitting. Um, their, uh, the coin ended up splitting because of this uh, uh, encoding, perhaps uh, perhaps intentionally. I don't know. Um, so even with consensus problems, if you're a business, you can you can solve this by having multiple nodes in multiple locations. And preferably, you should use different versions of Bitcoin Core, or different versions of, of, of the client, so that you have um, so that you cover all bases. And um, if there is a fork, uh, I think the most natural thing is to send your transactions on both sides. That may mean that you lose money if both become different coins, which is weird and confusing and very trendy right now. Um, but uh, usually, this would be safe from a, from a business perspective. Um, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, other ways that Bitcoin D is broken? Oh, um, unconfirmed transactions are not buggy. Um, right. 
Um, oh, you're talking about the way the get balance works with unconfirmed transactions? I'm talking about Bitcoin being one system. Mm -hmm. And if it's uh, has both layers that are working on the same block system, then Bitcoin being is currently the broken and which is the different. Yeah. Um, well, the accounting system isn't really related to unconfirmed transactions, so I'm not really sure what you're... Okay, well, I think I can get it. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. <coughs> Thank you very much.